No Kimbrel, no Cano, no Kulo, no problem for the back end of the Orioles bullpen as they win it 4-2 to two over the Yankees on Tuesday. And I'll recap the win coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fans, today is Wednesday, May 1st, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 4-2 victory over the New York Yankees on Tuesday night, getting the five things you need to know from that one, including a big-time start from Dean Kramer, the Orioles capitalizing on some Yankees miscues, and the bullpen, the middle part of the bullpen, really stepping up. And then we'll jump into an updated version, a May 1st version, of our bullpen trust power rankings. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Prize Picks the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. So let's jump into a big time victory on Tuesday night. Oriole Park at Camden Yards was the site. Final score, the Orioles four and the New York Yankees two in game two of a four game set. Orioles have now won the first two games of this series after taking game one to nothing. On Monday night, the Orioles now 19-10 and 10 on the year through 29 games. That is how they end the kind of March slash April month at 19-10. and 10. And they take over first place all by themselves. Now a game up on the Yankees sitting atop the AL East. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 4-2 win over the Yankees on Tuesday night, which I was in the ballpark to see after seeing a loss to the Brewers in my first game this year, now 1-1 one and one in the ballpark on the season. And the first thing you need to know is Dean Kramer gave the Orioles length when they absolutely needed it. We'll get to it in a moment. I already mentioned it, but the Orioles top three relievers at the back end of the bullpen, Craig Kimbrell, Yenier Cano, Danny Coulomb, none of them were available to pitch out of the bullpen on Tuesday night. So you knew the Orioles could have gotten through this game, which they did, but we knew, hey, if Dean Kramer can only get through five innings or so, it could be really, really tough for the Orioles pen to finish off this game against this Yankee lineup. But Kramer, now it wasn't his best start of the year. He he threw seven scoreless in Pittsburgh earlier this season. But in terms of the circumstances, this might have been the biggest that Dean Kramer has stepped up all season so far. Seven innings for Kramer, as I mentioned, with just the two earned runs allowed on the night. Both of them solo homers. Austin Wells got him for his first homer of the year in the third. And then I, I, I do have to shout out Juan Soto. I mean, he's one of the best players in baseball. It is scary that the Yankees have him now. And that home run that Soto hit in the sixth inning, 447 feet to Utah Street, 113 off the bat, felt like it went 547 feet and felt like it was at 200 miles per hour off the bat. That was a majestic shot. But otherwise, that is all Dean Kramer gave up in the runs category on Tuesday night. Four strikeouts, now four walks, was a little concerning. Two runs on four hits and the two homers I mentioned, 93 pitches for Kramer through seven innings. And listen, the Yankees did hit him hard a bit. Eight hard hit balls, not a terrible number for Kramer, but they squared him up. But Dean Kramer got ground balls when he needed ground balls. And that was a big part of the win on Tuesday. There was traffic on the bases, right? Four hits, four walks in seven innings. You're going to have base runners out there. And four walks, that was the most walks in any start this season so far for Kramer. He's done a great job of limiting walks this year. That was a little bit of a problem. His command wasn't perfect, but he erased them with big double plays. Three ground ball double plays turned behind Kramer in this game. All of them were huge. In different parts of this ballgame, he was able to keep the ball generally on the ground against this Yankee lineup. And again, it wasn't magical. He wasn't, you know, striking out 10 like he did in his last start. He wasn't missing a crazy amount of bats. I mean, he only got seven whiffs on 38 swings, but he was heavy cutter, 34 of 93 pitches, by far his number one pitch on the night. And he was using that to get strikes. Then he had the four seamer. He had the sinker. The velocity was a little up on those pitches, which was nice to see. And then the offering, I think, that impressed me the most on Tuesday was that new splitter. John Mioli 
had a good piece about Dean Kramer's new splitter, I believe last week in the Baltimore Banner, about how he'd always thrown a changeup, but he turned it into more of a split change and, and a true splitter this year. And he's thrown it, you know, a few times here and there. And, and again, it was only 13 of his 93 pitches on Tuesday were that splitter. But this was the first time I feel like it really had an impact and a positive impact when he threw it. Four whiffs on eight swings against that splitter, a couple of foul balls against it as well. I mean, that's really, really good. When you're getting eight swings on it and six of them end up as just strikes in the column, that is a huge W for that splitter. Hopefully we'll see him use it more and more as the season goes on. Again, not a perfect start from Dean Kramer, but exactly what the doctor ordered for the Orioles in this one. And the second thing you need to know from the win on Tuesday night is that the middle part of this bullpen stepped up when it needed to. And I'm going to get to this and the performances of Keegan Aiken and Jacob Webb and why they were out there in more detail in the second segment of the show. But we just got to start with a shout out to those two guys. As I mentioned, Cano, Kulo, Kimbrell, not available in this game. And of course, it had to be a close game, a two-run game. Even though Dean Kramer gave you seventh, you needed six outs against this Yankee order and against the meat of the Yankee order as well to get this win. Keegan Aiken, two huge outs. Jacob Webb, four insane outs to get the save for the Orioles with three strikeouts. He retired all four batters he faced. He was dominant. I mean, just shout out to those two guys. They've both been solid middle relievers so far this year, but quietly, Jacob Webb has a 2.03 ERA. We'll get to the two of them a little bit more coming up later on the show. Third thing you need to know from the Orioles' 4-2 to two win over the Yankees on Tuesday is that I got to tell you, the Yankees' terrible defense certainly helped the Orioles' offense in this game. Now, it helped them blatantly open the scoring because whatever happened for the Orioles to get on the board with a run in the second inning against Nestor Cortez, who got the start for the Yankees in this one, I still don't understand what the Yankees were doing out there. Anthony Santander leads off the inning with just kind of a lazy fly ball down the right field line. It was kind of a tough play. Juan Soto was swung over towards the gap, but he got a terrible read on it. Anthony Rizzo was like all the way out from first base to right field, and then it nips off his glove. He drops it. It lands in fair territory, and Santander coasts in for what they called a leadoff double on a ball that should have been caught. Then the next batter, Jordan Westberg, does his job. He hits a ground ball to second base. Generally, that's going to get the runner over to third with one out, but it was a one-hopper hit to Glaber Torres at second base, and he made the right play. He knows Santander does not run well. He picked it up on one hop. He turned to third, and a good throw easily nabs Santander at third base and gets the lead runner. What does Torres do? He doesn't step and clear the runner. He throws it directly into the back of Anthony Santander. It dribbles towards the dugout past third base. Santander gets up. Tony Mancelino, the Orioles' third base coach, is given him the big like stop sign, stay here. Santander says, uh-uh. I'm going to turn on the Jets. And Santander has looked like his feet hurt every time he's tried to run at any point this year. But when he really needs to get to a ball in the gap or really needs to score on a play, he takes it up to another gear where I'm not going to call him fast, but it's at least a lot better to watch. And he turned on that gear, sliding in safely to beat the throw at home to put the Orioles up one nothing. And it was a kind of just a game of, of bad defense. Like when you look in the box score, I believe that ended up being the only true error that the Yankees committed. But like... There were two infield hits by the Orioles that could have been outs if they had made a little bit cleaner plays. There were some bloop singles that dropped in in front of Juan Soto where he looked like he'd never played right field before. And, and trust me, as good as Juan Soto is as a hitter, he is a very bad defender out there in the outfield. And it certainly showed on Tuesday night. It was just tough to watch them. And you combine that with the terrible error that Anthony Volpe made at shortstop on Monday night to allow the Orioles to score that huge insurance run in the bottom of the eighth in game one of this series. Just been a bad, bad series for the Yankees. The Orioles certainly were able to capitalize. And they even did capitalize in that fourth thing because the fourth thing you need to know from this Oriole win is that really the rest of the offense was in that fourth inning rally. They put up three runs against Nestor Cortez and did get a little help from the Yankees defense. Now, Jorge Mateo scorched a double to lead off the inning. Mullen struck out, but then James McCann one hopped a ball off the big wall in left field for an RBI double, scoring Mateo and putting the Orioles up two to one. Hey, all the Yankees fans who are complaining about how far the wall is back now and how it's a stupid ballpark, uh, James McCann just hit it over Aaron Judge's head in left field and still got a double. It's pretty easy. It's just a skill issue. Just hit the ball further. Not that difficult. Just hit the ball further. He got an RBI double, then Colton Kowser had an infield single, Gunnar Henderson with an RBI infield single. Both of those singles, just incredible hustle down the line from both of those guys to beat them out. They were bang-bang plays at first base. 
Then Adley Rutschman kind of looped one in to right center field that I thought was maybe going to be caught. It just landed in for an RBI single, made it four to one, and the Orioles didn't necessarily pull away at four to one in the fourth inning, but it was a nice little rally by this offense against Cortez, who used to dominate the O's, but recently they've been on him much better. And they certainly showed that on Tuesday night. And then the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles win on Tuesday is that, listen, first base defense is really hard to quantify. And sometimes, you know, the best first base defenders don't have amazing stats that you can look at. But just from the eye test this year, and I'll tell you, I haven't watched, you know, innings of every single everyday first baseman. But I feel like Ryan Mountcastle has a real shot to win the gold glove at first base this year. That's pretty impressive for a guy who was drafted as a shortstop out of high school. The Orioles tried him at short, tried him at third, and tried him in left field. That was a complete disaster, him in left field. He finally found a home at first base. He's been getting better and better defensively every year. Now, StatCast has him for a negative three outs above average, but it's really tough to quantify those stats at first base. And I got to tell you, just from the eye test, I mean, Mountcastle has been swinging the bat really well this year. He was the only Oriole without a hit on Tuesday night. He went 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts. Everybody else had at least one hit. Rutschman was the only one with two as the O's got four runs on nine hits. But he did it with the glove. And he was part of two fantastic double plays defensively for the Orioles. Made an awesome scoop on a Juan Soto ball. He picked it out of there out of nowhere on one hop. Made a great throw to second. And then shout out to Jorge Mateo, who came over and instead of Mountcastle or the pitcher, Dean Kramer, he was the one who then covered first on the return throw, and the Orioles got the double play. And then on another double play on a 5-4-3, Jorge Mateo, not a great throw from second to first. Mountcastle scooped it out just in time to get the out at first base. It's been all year. He's been playing a fantastic defensive first base. Jim Palmer says it all the time on the broadcast. He thinks he's going to win a gold glove. I think he could, too. It's it's really cool to see him finally find a position. And and added to the fact that he's hitting 293 with an 836 OPS, like he's producing at the plate as well. He's an everyday player. He is kind of a an I think an underappreciated boost in this Orioles order, both with the bat and with the glove as well. But the O's got that huge win, four to two over the Yankees on Tuesday night. And there were a lot of pieces that came together for the Orioles to win this game. But the biggest shout out has to go to Keegan Aiken and Jacob Webb, two middle relievers who got the final six high leverage outs against the middle of the Yankee order. That was a big ask for a bullpen that struggled a bit, and they stepped up to the plate. So coming up next, we'll break down a little further how those two got the six outs and what it means for the Orioles bullpen as a whole as it moves forward and gets healthier here coming up this season. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by DoorDash. Now, we've got Mother's Day coming up in just a couple of weeks here, and DoorDash is going to be the place to be because your mom is a gift. So give her the best this Mother's Day. Get gifts as thoughtful as she is with DoorDash. Select from hundreds of expertly crafted bouquets to the best of tech to self-care essentials and more delivered right to her door. It's never too late to show mom your love on Mother's Day with DoorDash. Does she love tech? Does she have a sweet tooth, a beauty connoisseur? Whatever it is, you can get everything you need with DoorDash. Shop with savings that would make her proud. With a Dash Pass membership, you'll save with a $0 delivery fee and reduce service fees on eligible orders from Dash Pass merchants that meet the minimum subtotal. Other fees apply and terms apply as well. So get all your Mother's Day gifts all in one place. And get 50% off your next order up to $15 when you spend $15 or more on your next flower, convenience, grocery, or retail order now with code Locked On MLB. That is code Locked On MLB when you order using DoorDash today. Terms apply. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Now, we are into the Major League Baseball season, and you don't want to miss your chance to add your favorite players from the Diamond. In your prize picks entries, whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, whatever the stat may be from prize picks, you just pick more or less on the stat and add them to your prize picks entry. It is truly that easy. Prize picks gives you a statistic. You either say that player is going to get more or get less, and that is it. And it goes on for the NBA playoffs as well, which are in full swing. It is such a fun way to play Delhi fantasy sports. So download the app today. 
and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the Prize Picks app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100 at Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So the Orioles have now taken the first two games of this series over the Yankees, winning at 4-2 to two on Tuesday night. And a huge part of that Tuesday win was the middle part of the Orioles' bullpen. Because coming into this game, the Orioles didn't have Craig Kimbrell. He did throw on the field, but apparently that back tightness is still an issue. Didn't have Yenir Cano, who had pitched in the last two games and three out of the last four. Didn't have Danny Coulomb. Same thing. Two games in a row, three out of the last four. Brandon Hyde is not going to use a guy again the next day after pitching like that. So you look down in the Orioles' bullpen, and it was Mike Bauman, CNL Perez, who, although he looked good on Monday night, just coming off the injury list, Johan Ramirez, Jacob Webb, and Keegan Aiken. You had to find a way to finish the game with those five. Now, Dean Kramer certainly played a huge part in this. Throwing seven innings of two-run ball was fantastic and a huge help here. But you still had to get six outs against the middle of the Yankee order with those pitchers available. And not only did Brandon Hyde push the right buttons, but the two guys he went to in Keegan Aiken and Jacob Webb certainly delivered. And I just wanted to give a shout out to those guys because they both had good seasons, right? Aiken with a 3-2-9 ERA, gotten some big outs. Webb with a 2-0-3 ERA, but they don't get, you know, a lot of the, the praise that some of the other guys later in the back end of the bullpen get. And they've had some blow up outings. Each of them have had really bad moments that have cost the Orioles a game or two so far this year. And you know, even last year, Aiken was bad, then got injured. Webb was good, but then struggled down the stretch. Remember, Jacob Webb gave up a home run in each of the first two Orioles postseason games against the Rangers. So didn't have a good taste in your mouth for either of these guys coming into the season, but they both made the opening day roster. Webb technically went on the paternity list for two days, but then eventually did come back and have a roster spot. And while they haven't been you know, consistently used as high leverage guys this year, They've both been pretty good. They've gotten some key outs from time to time. And you've seen Aiken and Webb, as the season has gone on, move into higher and higher leverage roles. Now, they're still below in the pecking order, Kimbrel, Coulomb, and Cano. But it seems like Aiken and Webb, at this point in the bullpen, are number four and number five in terms of who Brandon Hyde wants to go to out of the pen. And at one point, when we were talking about, you know, seeing so, you know, Perez coming back, and now we have John Means and Bradish coming back soon, and hopefully Tyler Wells will be back as well. Aiken and Webb were thrown into that group of, oh, you could easily get rid of them, right? Aiken has options. He could go down. Webb has to be DFA'd, but he might have been the last guy to make the roster anyway, so he's an easy move. Now it feels a little different. I'll get to that a little bit more. We're doing bullpen trust rankings to finish off the podcast. But these guys came in in some high leverage spots and got some huge outs. I mean, shout out to Keegan Aiken on Friday night. Remember, he came in after Kimbrell gave up the run and left the bases loaded with one out, got a strikeout and a pop out to keep that game tied at two against the A's heading into the bottom of the ninth. Those were huge outs from Aiken. Aiken also went six up, six down on Sunday in relief after Albert Suarez struggled and only gave the Orioles four innings. Those were six huge outs. Those didn't end up winning either of those games, but got some big time outs from Keegan Aiken. And these outs were even bigger. Hyde goes to Aiken to begin the eighth inning, Orioles leading 4-2, to two, and it was the right move. You had the lefty in Grisham, the righty in Volpe, and then the lefty in Juan Soto do up for the Yankees, and he strikes out Grisham. Volpe does single off him, but it was a battle between him and Soto, and he got Juan Soto to fly out to left field. That was a huge out, and then he takes Aiken out of the game because I don't care how well Keegan Aiken is pitching. I never want Keegan Aiken to face a right-handed hitter as good as Aaron Judge, even though Judge is struggling. And after an 0 for 3 night, night is now hitting just 207 on the year. I never want to see Aiken versus Judge unless it is a complete blowout game either way. So Brandon Hyde goes to who I think is the best right handed reliever available in the bullpen Tuesday night. Again, with Kimbrell and Cano unavailable, I would say Jacob Webb right now is better than Mike Bauman and is better than Johan Ramirez. And I think everyone would agree with that. So he says, All right, we got to get some righties out. Let's go to Jacob Webb. And Webb falls behind Aaron Judge, three and one. He's representing the tying run, you know, runner on first, two outs in the eighth inning. And those next two pitches that Webb threw to Judge to strike him out were pretty incredible. Fastball dotted on the outside corner at 94 that Judge swings through. And then a beautiful right on right changeup. That way, we're going to call strike anyway. But Judge swings through it for a huge strike three. And I got to tell you, Jacob Webb's changeup this year has kind of been unbelievable 
like his fastball is okay. You know, sometimes that breaking ball he throws the sweeper has been good, but the changeup this year has only allowed one hit all season. He's thrown it about 50 plus times. It's only allowed one hit, and that was a single. He's got now nine strikeouts on that pitch on the year. It's an opponent batting average of 063 with an 063 slugging percentage. It's got over a 36% whiff rate on that pitch. It's just kind of been incredible what he's done with that changeup. And the great thing about a righty who has a good ninja, not only can he get right-handers out, but Jacob Webb is actually getting left-handers out at a higher rate than righties, and that's because of that changeup. That is a huge pitch for righties across the league to get lefties out. And Webb's got a really, really good one. And all of a sudden, we've turned to the point where it's like Jacob Webb needs to stay in this bullpen because then he comes back out in the ninth inning. And I think that was the correct move as well. You had Stanton, Rizzo, Torres, so righty, lefty, righty, do up. And Brandon Hyde did get CNL Perez throwing because you know if it got to Austin Wells, you had the lefty Wells, the switch hitter Cabrera, the lefty Grisham. You were going to go to Perez if Webb let anybody get on. But Webb just attacked Stanton, Rizzo, and Torres. He struck out Stanton. I mean, just two pitches in the zone and then a breaking ball that John Carlos Stanton must have missed by four feet, swinging and missing at it in the dirt for strike one. Then he just goes high fastballs, pounding Anthony Rizzo with high fastballs, gets him to swing through one, and then throws just a good breaking pitch to Glaber Torres, gets him to ground out to third, and that's your ball game. I mean, Webb attacked the zone. The stuff was nasty. And this is not to put down what Keegan Aiken did because it was a good outing for Aiken, but he only got you two outs. But those four outs from Jacob Webb, I mean, the stuff has looked really good from him recently. Three swings on the four-seam fastball. All were swings and misses. Five swings on the changeup. Three were swings and misses. He threw one sweeper. It was the swing and a miss he got from Stanton to get the strikeout. Like, efficient. 15 pitchers for four outs just dominating the strike zone right there. And you love to see it. And all his velocities were up. You could tell he was kind of amped up to get that first Oriole save. His fastball was averaging 93 up to 95. He's usually averaging 92. His changeup was 85, 86. It's usually 83. Even the sweeper he threw, it's like a pitch he generally throws 81, 82. He threw it at 84. Like he was amped up on Tuesday night. And sometimes when guys get amped up like that, when they're in a bigger spot than they're used to, the stuff will get wild. They won't be able to throw strikes. That wasn't the case for Jacob Webb. He pounded the strike zone. And that was just, I was so impressed by what Webb did. And you got to shout out for, I mean, those are four of the biggest outs the Orioles bullpen has seen this year, just because of the scenario and having to go to him for a safe situation against the middle of the Yankees order. Think about this. He got Judge, Stanton, Rizzo, Torres out like it was nothing in a two-run game. Impressive by Jacob Webb. And for me, I think that's got to move Jacob Webb up into the trust category for the first time this season on the bullpen trust rankings. But who will join him in that trust category? We'll get to that to finish off the pod coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Monopoly Go. All right, we got to go game off for a second. We got to pause here to talk about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. There's a, there's, a, there's a violation there. You already talked about that, but there's just so much good stuff that is in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much more to get, like unique stickers and new playing pieces and emojis for taunting your friends when you play. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure and much more. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it now free on Google Play or the App Store. Monopoly Go. Game on. So after the performance from Keegan Aiken and Jacob Webb and the Orioles' huge 4-2 win over the New York Yankees on Tuesday night, I had to update my bullpen trust power rankings. For the second time this year, I felt like it was a good time to do it because the Orioles' bullpen is an interesting spot. They've got some guys who've been a little overworked. They've got some guys who are going to lose their jobs this week. Brandon Hyde said to the media before the game Tuesday that he has and they have internally decided when Kyle Bradish and John Means will be activated to the roster. It'll be at some point this week, but they've decided when and what their roles will be. But he was not ready to tell the media just yet. So they know what it's going to be, but we don't know yet. Now, my assumption is Kyle Bradish will start the Thursday game. 
against the Yankees, and that John Means will either start Friday or will be kind of the follower in relief for Bradish because I can't see him going more than five innings absolutely max in his first start back on Thursday. But until then, until those moves are made, we've still got kind of an interesting spot for the Oriole bullpen right now. So let's pull out the bullpen trust rankings. How does it work? Well, I've got three categories. Trust, maybe trust, and don't trust. And I take the eight relievers and throw them into those categories. And it's good. We're into May now, right? Let's reset those bullpen trust rankings. So I've got four pitchers right now in my trust category. First, it's Jacob Webb. For the first time this year, now he was in there a couple times last year when he was dominating. But for the first time this year, Jacob Webb is in my trust category. His stuff has looked so good lately. I mean, I just went through it, how good the changeup's been and the fastball with the velocity up. But even in his last couple of outings, like you think back to the outing he had last Wednesday against the Angels. He gave up a home run on the first pitch he threw. And then after that, the changeup were ridiculous. He was getting swings and misses left and right. Jacob Webb has been quietly really, really good over the past couple of outings here and again it's a, it's a 203 ERA on the season now like the, I'm kind of believing in Jacob Webb he's looking closer and closer to that two week stretch of dominance the Orioles got from Webb when they first brought him in off waivers from the Angels in August of last year second guy in the bullpen trust rankings trust category for the first time this year it is Keegan Aiken and how about that Keegan Aiken hasn't been in the trust category in a long long time but he is back because Brandon Hyde's trusting him right now He's going to him to get some big lefties out. He's going to him to get, you know, four, five, six outs. And he's delivering in these big spots. He's had that one real blow up outing in Kansas City. But otherwise, Aiken has been really, really good so far this year. And it's the fastball command. It's the good slider. He just throws strikes. He's got good ride on that fastball. The baseball savant page looks really good when you look at it for Keegan Aiken. I like the stuff he's got out there. Five straight scoreless appearances for Aiken since that blow up against Kansas City and he has only given up runs in two appearances this year like he has pitched 14 times for the Orioles only given up runs twice it was against Minnesota on April 15th two runs in a third of an inning and then Kansas City on April 19th three runs in a third of an inning so those two outings are really going to balloon your ERA and it's still at this point is only at 3.29 so he's still been good even with those two outings otherwise i mean 17 walks to three strike, or excuse me, 17 strikeouts, I should say. Now 18 strikeouts to three walks on the season. It's pretty impressive from what we've seen from Keegan Aiken. Third in the trust category and fourth in the trust category. They've been there all year. They'll continue to be there. Yenir Cano and Danny Coulomb are the two others in the trust category. Just been great in those setup roles. The two were a fantastic combination to close out the win on Monday night. I love the stuff from both of them. They've been great last year. They spent most of last year in the trust category. They're in it again. But for the first time this year, Craig Kimbrell has been moved down to the maybe trust category. And that's for two reasons. One, he looked really bad in his last two outings, the two blown saves. And two, we don't even know if he's healthy right now. He's dealing with this back tightness. He hasn't been put on the IL yet, but he hasn't been available for the last two nights. Save situations Monday and Tuesday. And it's been Danny Coulomb and Jacob Webb who have gotten those saves for the Orioles. So we will see, hopefully he gets himself healthy, gets back to what he was, you know, those first couple weeks of the year when he had a sub one ERA and was saving game after game for the Orioles. But right now with how he looks, he's got to be in maybe trust. And he joins CNL Perez in maybe trust. First time for him on the rankings this year. The only reason he's in maybe trust is that he just came back from injury. Yes, he did look good with the scoreless outing he tossed on Monday night coming back from the IL, but you got to see more than one outing off the IL from an oblique injury to put him in the trust category. If I see like two more scoreless outings, three more scoreless outings from Perez, he will easily jump into trust. Right now, that's really the only reason he's in maybe trust. And then the two in don't trust, I think everyone would agree with this. Johan Ramirez and Mike Bauman. Ramirez has not been used in over a week now. He last pitched last Tuesday in Anaheim. The O's are avoiding him. And I think what we're going to see here one of the two moves, Means and Bradish, that are coming this week, it seems almost written on the wall that Johan Ramirez getting DFA'd is going to be one of the corresponding moves. He hasn't literally has not pitched in a week. The O's aren't using him. They're going to get rid of him. I, I, I'm pretty sure about that. And the other one is Mike Bauman. He's had some better outings recently, but he also hasn't pitched in a little while. He last pitched in a, a blowout game through a scoreless inning on Saturday. Like He hasn't pitched in these big spots Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. O's have been using him less because he hasn't been good. And, and I got to tell you, Bauman also kind of right on this bubble to lose a spot when Means and Bradish come back. And 
I think at this point you can't option Aiken. He's been too good. So you're probably down to one of three. You got to make two of these three moves. Bauman DFA, Ramirez DFA, or place Craig Kimbrell on the injured list. I still think they're going to IL Kimbrell and then DFA Ramirez and Bauman will hold on for just a little bit longer, maybe until Tyler Wells comes back. But that would be my guess right now. But I'm not trusting Mike Bauman or Johan Ramirez in any big spot at this moment. But that'll do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure to leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you listen. And of course, like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. We will be back tomorrow. I'll be recapping game three between the Orioles and the Yankees. The O's will go for a series win here on Wednesday night. This four-game set trying to go 3-0 in that set and get a little further extended lead atop the AL East as they play their first game in May. And their ace is going to the hill. Corbin Burns pitching for the Orioles, the 2-5-5 ERA on the season. He will go up against the right-hander Luis Heal, who will pitch for the Yankees. The 25-year-old has a 4-0-1 ERA and five starts this season, although he has struck out a lot of batters this year. But his last start in Milwaukee did not go well. Five innings, five runs on six hits with six Ks and two walks. O's will try to get to heel on Wednesday night. Then I'm back with you on Thursday recapping the Wednesday night game and giving you any further info we may have about this return of Means and Bradish and any other Orioles news and notes. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.